the science can go kind of either way on whether cholesterol has a major impact on heart disease at all though, right? Is that about right? I'm like halfway a doctor. I don't ever trust anything I say basically because I could be halfway <laughs> wrong much. or you could be halfway dead. I guess you could maybe say that that is low-ish. So maybe he did mm. donate blood and I know it, that could be TRT. Um, usually probably between 20 and 30 would be optimal and yours is at 40. These are gonna be the biggest thing that somebody can look at to see if one is natural or not. When you look at this, it tells you right off about your pre-diabetic. Hop on this hot dick mm. <laughs> with hot kiss. Does that stay in the podcast or no? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, keep it in. <laughs> all right, we're rolling, guys. <laughs> you have Doctor Who on the air today. It's one of those days, Doctor Hot Hot Kiss, Hot, hot Kiss, Hot Kiss, hot, kiss. Hot, or kiss. hot Dick, like I like to call it. God. Well, <laughs> nah. <laughs> what are we doing today in Sema? What the? Let's uh, game faces on. Game oh, oh, yeah, you gotta be serious. Yeah. Yeah. So I got my blood work done again at Merrick. Um, I got it done last year and ooh, the year before, opening up a gorilla mind, energy drink. I just spilled it all over myself. It's because you can't it's aim with your mouth. Yeah, what is wrong with me? <laughs> You're just like my girl. She can't ever get like she water get in it. her mouth. Mm. You know, she's always drinking and then it just drips. She has a drinking problem. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then that just it gets so hot, gets me bothered, and then I'm just like, ooh, let's go. But I got my blood work. Ends done. up all of her glasses and everything. I've seen this before. Oh, oh, yeah. Yes, you know you haven't. That's offensive, Mark. <laughs> well, I mean I've You're seen. a married man. Am I? <laughs> <laughs> Is that a big deal? <laughs> no. <laughs> you know what? She never really did answer me. When I proposed to her, she just like cried. I was like, well, that's, I've seen this reaction before mm -hmm. to me uh, wanting to be with somebody for a longer period of time. <laughs> really? So she just like cried. She never said yes. Right. Wow. She claims that she did. <laughs> Have you looked at the paperwork? No, <laughs> but I'm pretty sure she owns everything. So <laughs> I'm glad I never looked. Oh man. Anyway, we have Dr. Hotchkiss uh, and Merrick did a blood panel and everything. So we wanted to have him just go over on air things that he thinks I should adjust, things that he thinks may be helpful because things look good for the most part, but there are always things you can improve. And, you know, we talk a lot about getting blood work done, whether you are on anything or not. And it's good to understand where your levels are so that, you know, as you progress and as you're doing things athletically, you can make sure from year to year or every half, every six months mm -hmm. that you are at the peak of your game. I got some tournaments coming up too. So I want to make sure mm. that I'm feeling good. Optimal. Cool. Yeah, Dan Garner did a bunch of blood work on me before, and when Merrick's looked at my blood work, they're just like, this is a fucking biohazard. We don't know what we're looking at. This is too thick. You got six minutes to live, so we're going to check out and see his blood and see what's going on. Cool. Man, I've been, whoa, whoa, I've been tanning. Wow. Mm -hmm. Ooh, look at that guy. Wow, he's got a special background. <laughs> uh, you know, Yo, why, why is your hairline so sharp? Yeah. Thanks. Doing well. How are you? Oh, I'm good. Hey, I haven't seen you guys in a while. How you been? Thanks for going good, man. Ready to dive yeah. into some of this blood work? Hell yeah, I'm definitely ready. How how uh how important do you think just in general like is blood work uh, for someone just to get like a base in their health? Oh, it's absolutely important. You know, it's like just getting a look under the hood. You know, you could be driving a car and and you think everything's fine, but. If, you know, the engine's all effed up, then, you know, and, and I liken that to the human body, you know, you could feel okay. So a lot of people, I mean, Mark, you and I have had our experiences with, uh, you know, a lot of gear, you can feel really good and you're like, Hey, yeah. I'm feeling good, but it's not doing a good thing to you. So, right. um, just cause you're feeling okay. doesn't necessarily mean that everything's working. Okay. So that's where a lot of work, you know, really can help. Mm. And actually I have a quick question too, because it's like, the lab work that I got recently I ended up, I think I got to the clinic at like 2 p.m. So there is a, and I was fasted, but there is a difference in you getting blood work in the morning versus getting it later in the day. So when you get it done, do you want to be making sure that you get your lab work done usually at the same time of day each time you do it? Or does that matter that much? Yeah, it definitely matters, especially when you care about like testosterone. That's the big one. Mm -hmm. um, testosterone, it kind of fluctuates throughout the day. It's called a diurnal pattern where... It's highest in the morning. So right after you wake up, your testosterone will be the highest. By the end of the day, it could have potentially dropped by like 200 points. Mm. And so, you know, you could be going at the end of the day and your levels are coming back as low, but they're not actually low, you know. Yeah. Um, so for that reason, it's definitely beneficial to go first thing in the morning. Also good to avoid training for a few days. I just looked over yours and some things that we'll get to, you know, looks like you may Obviously, you train a lot, and it yeah. may have impacted your labs in some ways. Um, so 
we'll usually recommend not training for a few days before and then getting them first thing in the morning so that we get that accurate reading on your hormone levels. Yeah, that's a, I'll say two things. That's a tough thing because I never really have multiple days off of training. Um, but the one consistent thing that's been with my labs, because you guys have had my like three or four pieces of lab work done, is they were all done usually around 2 or 3 p.m. So at least... It's the same time of day, but I'm exactly, yeah, trying. that's fine. I mean, I, as long as you know that, you know, cause it's, uh, like I said, some guys will, maybe they're producing adequate levels of testosterone, but they go at the end of the day after working all day, et cetera. Mm-hmm. And it's a little bit lower and they could inappropriately maybe hop on some TRT when they didn't necessarily need to. Yeah. So it's not a terrible thing, but it's just good to try to get that the highest level of the day. But I mean, I guess the argument could be made for some guys who maybe their levels are crashing into that low range that, mm-hmm. Hey, at the end of the day, I, I have low testosterone and maybe that's why you do need TRT. So as long as you just kind of remember and then bring that up with a provider too, because otherwise, you know, the, the provider doesn't know and they should take that kind of stuff into account when they're reading your labs. Gotcha. What's the, uh, what's the line, you know, in term, or is there like a gray area in terms of like prescribing certain medications? Somebody comes to you, uh, they have it in their head, they're going to Merrick and they're going to get steroids and they're going to, you know, b- blast all this stuff and get big and huge or whatever it might be. Um, but if someone does have like a normal range of testosterone, uh, medically, are you guys allowed to, you know, boost somebody up to like a more optimal level so they can pursue? Maybe, maybe they really like bodybuilding. Maybe they really like powerlifting. Is that allowed, or is that something you guys try to stay away from? How does that work? The weird thing is, legally, it's actually not allowed. As stupid as it is, and I think we talked about this the last time, that I think it's just absurd. It, it literally, in most state licenses, there's a paragraph on the use of anabolic steroids and growth hormone that literally says that these cannot be prescribed for performance enhancing benefits, which, wow. you know, is just so stupid. Like, yeah, that's interesting. I, you right? know, I could get into the legality of that a lot, but um, if a doctor feels like, you know, somebody with a 400 testosterone is feeling symptomatic and they would have better health outcomes, the doctor can prescribe it off label. The doctor just theoretically wouldn't be allowed to dictate in their chart that I'm prescribing this so that Johnny can get bigger biceps. You know, um, you have to actually say like Johnny has experiencing a lack of more interactions. He's been fatigued. He, uh, you know, has the loss of libido. Et cetera, Tough to et get it up when you're is, pissed about small biceps though. Right. <laughs> that, yeah. that is true. That is true. And he's probably not getting any, you know, cause his arms are too small. Is he? So, <laughs> 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 no, but yeah, I mean, yeah, if you feel like if, if the provider feels like there's a, you know, something in their health could benefit from it outside of just performance enhancing, then they can write for it off label. Nice. What are some things that you can recognize in someone's blood? And uh, if you're, if you have an opportunity to see that person, whether it's via zoom or in person, where you can tell that someone's pretty much lying to you about their health practices. Mm. Like, is there stuff that shows up in the blood where you're like, bro, (laughs) like, I know you're not sleeping. Like this blood shows me that your sleep habits are not great. It shows Mm. me ABC. For sure. Yeah, definitely. That happens all the time. I mean, also it happens on the, where people say they're not using things Mm. like, you know, maybe we'll be able to, uh, uh, you know, trick or find and see out today that uh, he's been lying to us the whole time. But uh, I think my very first client I saw at Merrick came on and his LHFSH completely suppressed. I mean, he's, his brain's not signaling to his test. He's his testosterone super low, but his estrogen super high, red blood cell count, super high. All of these things basically, you know, yell steroid. And I'm like, Dude, you could tell me he was just lying through his teeth. Nope. And I almost wanted to be like, well, then I'm not going to prescribe you testosterone. I I totally would if you would just be honest with me, because then we can maybe talk about some cycles we did. You know, like (laughs) we can we can have a normal conversation, but that would be one. But yeah, there's other times when, you know, I feel like, you know, that meme of like Jerry Springer when it says like, you know, you said this and this, but, you know, the lie detector says you're lying. Like that's how people would be like, (laughs) I'm super dialed in, but they're fast and insulin sky high. They've got a pre-diabetic A1C. Their lipids are all skewed. Their IGF-1 is low. (laughs) 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 Exactly. I'm like, you are not living the lifestyle that you're telling me that you are. I can tell, you know. Mm. How about uh, manipulating labs? Because I've gotten some blood work like done fairly close and like the testosterone levels were 
pretty drastically different. So in my head, I'm thinking like, well, shoot, if I want this outcome to be, you know, if I want to, if I want the results to show like a lower test because I, my doctor's not really getting with the program, um, can somebody actually like purposefully lower their testosterone levels to get the labs drawn so that way they can get prescribed something? <laughs> Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, <laughs> back when I was first like bodybuilding and stuff, it was pretty common. You would read on the forums ways that you could actually suppress your testosterone, which nowadays, you know, TRT clinics are on every corner. They're like Starbucks and you just have to have a pulse at this point. But back in the day, it was like, you know, drink the night before, be dehydrated. Um, I don't know all the other masturbate. I don't know all these things. You could do all these things, not sleep so that your levels would be lower when you went in. I definitely remember that was like a sticky on some of the forums on how to get legal TRT. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, before we go diving into Encima stuff, uh, I'd like to maybe get a, some quick information from you about uh, semaglutide and drugs that are similar to that. Uh, it seems yeah. like to be kind of all the rage and people are utilizing that uh, to lose weight seems to be pretty effective. I think I may have heard it's helping a lot of people lose like 20 or 30 pounds. Uh, what are the side effects? What are the negative impacts? What are maybe things that um, people aren't looking at? Yeah, I mean, it has a ton of side effects. Um, it's uh, you know, around 40% of people will experience some nausea. So it's a pretty significant amount. That's probably the most common thing that people get is nausea with it. Um, that will usually persist for the first week or two and then usually dissipates, um, can also cause either diarrhea or constipation. Oof. Constipation I see more frequently because it is slowing gastric emptying. That's part of how it makes you feel full as your food moves down your gut slower. So it can kind of block you up and people get heartburn as well. Um, more of the, the scary, um, side effects with it are either medullary thyroid carcinoma or what's called neo um, an endocrine dysplasia um, and that's pretty rare it's not actually ever been sh uh, shown in human trials or in human uh, participants it's just been linked to a possibility due to seeing it in rat models so if you have a family history of that thyroid carcinoma just avoid it um, but for some people that's kind of scary knowing that it could potentially be associated with it so yeah, there's definitely side effects. Um, there's been kind of talk recently from people like Peter Atia, who he feels like it may, you know, kind of eat away at muscle, but I would push back pretty hard on him on that one. Cause I don't think there's anything inherent to semaglutide or terzepatide or any of these GLP one receptor agonists that cause muscle wasting. I mean, it's just like any other cut. If you go into a, a drastic cut and you don't have your protein high, and you're not resistance training, then of course you're going to lose muscle. We all know that yep. anybody in the fitness space knows that. So literally all this is doing is taking people and making them not hungry. So they stop eating. And of course, we're going to see that in obese test subjects who don't train and don't eat enough protein when suddenly they reduce their calories, they're going to lose muscle mass. So I think that you can dial in your protein and probably doing so like I'll usually suggest get protein shakes because you're going to get full quick. Mm -hmm. So you're going to need to prioritize your protein. Or I tell them if you've got a plate of food, hit the chicken breast or the steak or the salmon or whatever first before moving on to the carbs and vegetables, because you may get full halfway through and you want to try to hit that protein. So if you just really try to hit your, I don't know, you can say gram per pound of body weight and protein, you're mm -hmm. likely going to be fine. Just like you're on any other cut. Cool. Let's uh, check out the blood work. All right. Do you guys got it on your end to, to pull up? Um, I can email it over to Andrew real quick. Give me yeah, I don't know if you got second. the magic over there to pull it up on the screen. You know how to, are you a wizard like that? Me or, or Andrew? Andrew's mm -hmm. definitely a wizard, but All I right. could. I'll work on it. <laughs> I could maybe do it on mine. Yeah, you never I've know. I've got it on a different computer. I have it right here. I can forward it to Andrew. Include attachments. Okay, cool. And then Sima, you're cool with us uh, putting this out on the for the world to to see. I signed the documents, so oh, yeah, it's hey, over. It's Smokey done. wrote me a few times, like you got to make sure he's okay with this. And mm -hmm. I was like, I think he's he's probably okay with it. Yeah, yeah, it's all good. Um, Andrew, you got so in that is two attachments of. Uh, but uh, Adam, do you want him to pull up the one that's the lab report? Because the lab report is Let's, like. I think it has merit. Let's do the, uh, the LabCorp ones and not the Merrick ones. And we can just talk about raw data so that people okay. see it from LabCorp. Otherwise, we could have 
altered yours, you know, because we made your other one for you. Gotcha. All right. So, Andrew, you'll see the LabCorp one. So, actually, uh, before we get into it, something really interesting that Merrick does is there are normal reference ranges, and then there are the reference ranges that you guys suggest. So, what is the difference with that? Because, like, you know, if somebody goes to a normal doctor and they have certain levels, the doctor's going to say, oh, this is, you know, you're, you're in the reference range for normal testosterone. You're at 400. That's fine. Yeah. But Merrick has optimized reference ranges for everything. Yeah, this is a question I get a lot because people are like, holy crap, these are so drastically different. Why? And that's because what LabCorp or Quest or whoever puts out, those are normal labs and nobody or us, we don't want to be normal, right? And so normal means that they take the second percentile all the way up to the 97th percentile. That's a massive range. Yeah. So you literally have, you know, the second where you're at the, the bottom of the barrel and if you think about the people who are getting labs, they're usually pretty sick. And this is coming from a, a population of people getting labs and you take the average or you take that that range, that second to the 97th. So that's insane. Mm -hmm. And so there's no wonder why they say that a normal testosterone is like 200 to 900. And everybody knows you're going to feel significantly different at a 200 than you are at a 900. And so what we try to do is say, where can we tease out of the data where the optimal human beings are that aren't only disease free, but are actually thriving because a lot of what medicine does right now is just to either make you disease free or make it so that you can live with disease and just basically not die. Yeah. And if you want to do more than just not die and you want to thrive, then maybe you should opt for these ranges is what we tell people. Cool. Awesome. So, yeah, I mean, I guess we can, I'll just start right at the top. Uh, I don't know if you want to follow along and see what you like on your phone and ask okay. any questions or, yeah. but you know, at the top of lab corpse, right off the bat, we get, your TSH and your free T4. So these are your thyroid hormones. TSH stands for thyroid stimulating hormone. It's the hormone that we can basically say your brain starts to signal to your thyroid if it needs to make thyroid hormone and thyroid of course responsible for metabolism, energy levels and things like that. So in my opinion, I'm usually looking for a TSH below 2.5, but mm -hmm. as you can see, you know, the, the normal one for lab corpse is 4.5. So that again, is a big range at Merrick. Our guidelines are actually trying to get people below 1.5. Wow. I think 2.5 is okay, but you're at two, I would say you're good. And your, your levels of T4 are also pretty good. Um, for some reason, lab corp never puts T3 on there and you got to scroll all the way to the bottom. Sorry, Andrew, have fun and post on this one, but it's uh, <laughs> okay. the T3 is all the way at the bottom. Um, yours came back at 2.8. So I would say you're a little bit suboptimal as far as that goes. I would usually like to see levels above three. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's actually vital to, to get to. And this is something that most doctors wouldn't order. They don't order the T3. They only order the TSH, maybe the T4. But the T4 is your inactive thyroid, and then it converts over into T3, the active form. And so some people have a normal TSH and a normal T4, but still have all the symptoms of low thyroid, like poor metabolism, their energy is low, they have cold extremities, and their doctor's telling them their thyroid's fine, but then you can see your T3 and it may be super low. And that can usually be due to nutritional deficiencies. So things like zinc and iodine and selenium. Um, Iodine, unless you're, I mean, if you're using iodinized salt, you're probably good, but a lot of people have gone after pink salt and stuff and don't get enough iodine. You know, that's why Stan Efferdine's always harping on that. Um, zinc, you probably get a good amount of in uh, like meat and shellfish, but uh, selenium, Brazil nuts, I think are the best source. And a lot of us aren't eating a lot of Brazil nuts. So you may require some supplementation with like a multivitamin that has selenium in it. And that may help to convert that T4 into more optimal ranges of T3. Cool. So I guess I'll scroll back to the top again. And I just then this to point is where out we real start quick, to um, that oh, yeah. people uh, that maybe don't know, um, you can get T3 and or T4 or combination thereof prescribed and it just comes in a pill form. And for some people, it's uh, damn near life altering for them. A lot of women experience uh, issues with their thyroid where they have fatigue and they just don't really know what's wrong. And sometimes a simple prescription of some T3, T4 uh, can sometimes really be impactful on somebody. Yeah, absolutely. It's something that I actually even kind of took for granted before. Um, we have two PCCs actually have taught me a lot on it. We have a, one of our clinicians really good at thyroid as well. And 
Um, one of the PCCs is on TRT and, and actually had hypogonadal, like he's got an, a genetic issue where he had low testosterone. He optimized that, but his thyroid was also messed up. And he said that optimizing the thyroid was significantly more impactful than the testosterone was. Wow. So he felt night and day difference with better thyroid than he did with better testosterone. So again, I'm always harping on testosterone is not the end all be all. And so you make a great point, Mark, like it's a huge thing. If you have low thyroid and you're not checking that, you're only ordering your testosterone, maybe you're actually hypothyroidal and you, you feel like ter- like crap, you know. Okay. Um, but getting into this CBC, which is basically looking at your, your blood, is where we can start to kind of tease out whether and seem as a natty or not. So um, the main thing I would look for here is red blood cell count and your hemoglobin and your hematocrit. So your red blood cell count coming back at 4.46, which Oh, it went down just a little bit. So previously you're 4.64. So you're very normal as far as red blood cell count. Which means he donated blood before he got the Right Mm. before, the day before. (laughs) Yeah, It is possible, but we'll be able to tell that (laughs) potentially on some other labs too. So I'm going to try to be as like critical as I can and see if I can find, you know, anything. I'll I'll try to, of course, somebody in the comments is going to say we're lying, but I'll try to be (laughs) as like devil's advocate as I can. So yes, he certainly could have donated blood and um, you know, Mark knows, but the listeners may not that uh, taking testosterone increases your production of red blood cells. And so we usually will see at least a little bit of elevation um, in TRT. It's usually not as high as say like steroid use, but still, I wouldn't expect to see a 4.4 on somebody even on TRT. Unless of course he did just donate blood. Um, but also his hemoglobin and hematocrit are well within range. So hemoglobin's the protein, uh, the iron containing protein that carries around oxygen throughout your blood. And then the hematocrit is basically just a percentage of how many red blood cells are found within your blood. And both of those are totally normal too. So again, I mean, it looks pretty natty if you're just basing it off this alone, but like, you know, Mark said it, that's not the end all be all. Nothing else really in this part of the lab called the CBC, you, you look normal, all your cells, your different neutrophils and things look normal. So that's all good. So then we can scroll down to the um, what's called a CMP or a comprehensive metabolic panel, which is kind of looking at your kidney and your liver health. And then this is something, like I said, with athletes, it's important to have a provider who understands athletes and can look at their labs because right off the bat, we can see your creatinine is high and your GFR, which is your glomerular filtration rate, meaning how efficient your kidneys are filtering things out. Is super low. So we would almost think that, you know, something's wrong with your kidneys and your doctor may tell you you've got an issue with your kidneys because your creatinine is so high. Yeah. Um, but with athletes, a lot of things can increase creatinine. Um, creatinine is a byproduct of creatine metabolism. So we all have creatine. We make it every day. People who eat meat have more creatine. He, people who supplement with creatine usually have more creatine. Uh, creatine and creatinine. Yeah. Um, so I'm guessing, I know you eat a lot of meat. I, I know you train and break down too. a lot of muscle. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you supplement with creatine too? Every day. Yep. Exactly. So for that reason alone, like, you know, your, your creatinine will always be elevated. And so it's important to look at that and tease it out. I don't even like to look at it in any of the guys that's come, that are coming through unless they're like a sedentary individual who doesn't supplement. Because mm-hmm. for most guys who are listening to your guys' podcasts and using the Power Project Lab panel, they've probably lifted some weight in the past 24 hours or ate a steak or something that's going to elevate it. Um, so I don't think you got it on here, but we'll usually order what's called a cystatin C, which is a, a more accurate reading of your kidney function. There's also a newer one called a SDMA. So we can go into depth on athletes and really kind of see how their kidney function is regardless of any supplements or activities they're doing. Question real which, quick. Is yeah. there anything remotely problematic about having a high creatinine? Cause I remember actually when I was in my early twenties, I got a blood test done at the hospital just to like, like a routine checkup and the doctor's like, Oh, your creatinine's high. So it's been high like forever. Cause I've been supplementing creatine since I was like young. Right. Is there anything dangerous about it? Is there anything I need to think about or I'm good? Nope. Okay. No. Cause yours is, is totally normal. Um, yours is high due to the other things. So it could be high due to either producing large amounts of that from the creatine breakdown, totally normal. 
it would be problematic if it was high because your kidneys weren't filtering it all out. And so I guess I can't say that for sure looking at your labs because we don't have that cystatin C. Mm -hmm. um, but if we had that cystatin C, then we can do the GFR calculation and see what your GFR based on cystatin C would. And I would guess that yours is probably, you know, perfect. We should do that next time around though, just to, to see where your kidney function actually is. Okay. Um, the other one on here that was elevated for you is the AST, which is a liver enzyme. And then this is another one that I'm sure if you went to that same doctor, they would tell you not only your kidneys are fucked, but so is your liver. Um, and then again, there, you know, you have to look at it and kind of be nuanced about it here. So you have two kidney enzyme or two liver enzymes here, uh, your AST and your ALT. Um, I'll show you your alkaline phosphatase too, but uh, your ALT is normal and your AST is high. ALT is found more in the liver, so it's more liver specific. I just remember that kind of remember even from school, like that has an L in it, and so does liver. So it's more liver specific, mm -hmm. um, and that is normal. But your AST is high. AST is also found in muscle and heart and brain, and so most of the time, athletes are going to have elevated AST at least, especially if you've trained within the, the days leading up to it, and it will look like your kidney function is screwed, or your liver function is screwed even when it's not. So again. I would guess you're probably fine. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Um, your analysis here, not a lot that it's going to tell us you look normal. Your again, your kidneys are probably fine because we don't see any protein or glucose or anything in your kidneys, and we didn't previously either. Mm -hmm. So just more evidence as to you know your your kidney health is good. If somebody's um, kidneys are uh, maybe a little bit more out of whack, I know you would probably recommend more testing. But if you dug a little bit and found more issues with the kidneys and maybe more issues with the liver, um, there are some uh, like over-the-counter supplements that can be pretty effective for those uh, as well, right? Not rather than just uh, immediately going to prescription. Yeah. So for like liver specifically, and liver is a good, it's not a good one, but if you had to damage one or the other, I would damage my liver because it can rejuvenate <laughs> so quickly. Um, but liver things like Tudka, which is a bile salt uh, and acetylcysteine, which converts downstream into glutathione, which is a potent uh, antioxidant, which helps your liver, or you could even supplement with pure glutathione and you can get that in uh, like an injection form. So there's a lot of things that can benefit the liver. Um, milk thistle used to be the go-to. I think that's kind of been debunked all the time. I know so many people would take milk thistle with their anadrol and stuff, but <laughs> I would rather somebody take, uh, you know, Tudka or NAC because um, those ones are good. And then kidneys are tough though, because kidneys, I mean, after they're damaged, they're usually damaged. So it's some, you can take like astragalus. That's probably the one that has the most um, literature on it. And then there's some medications that can help like something like canagliflozin or even semaglutide can be beneficial for kidney health. Mm. Um, supplements, it's hard though. I mean, kidney health is something you should be really cognizant of. And unfortunately, a lot of bodybuilders and powerlifters aren't and they damage them due to elevated blood pressure. So kidney health, monitoring, getting that cystatin C or the SDMA, which you'll get if you get a full panel through Merrick um, is important because you don't want to screw up those kidneys. All right. Um, let's see. Lipid lipid panel would be next on you. So lipids are like your cholesterols and your triglycerides. So um, your triglycerides are great. Triglycerides are more a marker of your metabolic health rather than you know, just like your cardio. I mean, it is a good marker of cardiovascular health because it can affect your cardiovascular health. But if trigs are high, mm -hmm. it's usually due to being insulin resistant and having you know, poor metabolic health. So yours are nice and low and great, very metabolically healthy. Um, this is another one to look at for seeing if somebody is on TRT or PEDs is your HDL cholesterol, your high density lipoprotein cholesterol, HDL. Um, yours is good. It was 61 previously and 58. On one of my labs, looking at back and when I did cycles in the past, I have single digit HDL at one point. I don't think I've ever had above 30, even being on TRT. Um, and I, I eat, a, you know, take in significant amount of fish oils and do everything that I can to boost my HDL. But testosterone is highly suppressive on HDL cholesterol. So this is one that I kind of look at to see if guys are natty or not. And if their HDL is not suppressed, I'm usually like, OK, they're probably pretty natty because I don't know. Mark, have you seen the same on your labs with your HDL over the years? I've seen it as low as like 16 or something like that. Oh, I got you beat, man. But uh, I think that also was from, I mean, this is years ago. I think that was also from, from some uh, anti-estrogens. They, mm, yeah. they dry that shit out pretty good. 
Yeah, certainly can. And it's like I said, TRT, just testosterone as it is, will usually suppress your HDL. It may slightly increase your LDL too. So many other things do that I don't think it's a great marker. But um, looking at your LDL, your previous one was 57 and your current one is 80. Both of those are pretty darn good. There could be you know, an argument for like optimal cardiovascular health, having an LDLC around 70 is probably the best, but mm-hmm. you know, an average of your last two you would put you around there and that's pretty awesome. So I don't know like your diet model basically, but you tend to, you know, you're, you're doing well as far as your lipids go. Just a quick on my diet, like. I generally eat high fats. There's some days mm-hmm. I'm usually low carb. Some days when I feel really depleted, I'll just eat extra carbs because I feel like I need extra carbs, but it's always high fat. Um, I did have a question about uh, HDL because there are some people in the audience that are on TRT. Is there anything that they need to take into account if their HDL is very low? Is it something they need to worry about or are they okay because that's a that's what TRT will generally do? That's a tough one. At one point, you know, everybody knew HDL was the healthy cholesterol and we wanted to do everything we could to boost HDL. Yeah. And then there was some trials where they developed drugs that boosted HDL and it changed nothing. So their clinical outcomes were the same. People still had the same amount of heart heart attacks and strokes and cardiovascular incidents. So the thought that HDL is this protective, healthy cholesterol has definitely kind of changed. Mm. And so I mean, I definitely tell myself that to sleep at night because, like I said, mine suppress. <laughs> um, but we don't really know. Even lipidologists will tell you we're not so sure what it does anymore. The idea used to be that it was this reverse transport where it grabbed onto the LDL or quote unquote bad cholesterol and brought it back. But, you know, the thought is is kind of changed now. Um, regardless, I would still say have a robust amount of omega-3s in your diet. Most people don't. You know, mm. The standard American diet has a lot of omega-6s, not enough omega-3s. So, you may need to supplement with a fish oil or an omega ethyl ester or eat more fish, something like that to make sure that you're getting a good amount of omega threes in. And that's probably your, the best thing that you could do for your HDL. And just like poor heart health and or lipid profiles are mainly just from energy toxicity, just simply eating too much. And I think that people want to try to pin it on something specific, like it's sugar. I know it's sugar or I know it's saturated fat, you know, and it's, it, it, those things can have an impact on them, but I think it's when you combine those things, it just makes it easier to overeat eating processed Absolutely. foods, things like that are going to put you in a compromising spot. For sure. I have seen where people will eat too much saturated fat, even in a deficit and get an increase in LDL cholesterol. Um, where before I was actually, I, I argued in the fact that it was probably had more to do with energy than anything, like you said, eating too mm-hmm. much, but Recently, I saw a guy with a pretty severe eating disorder, only eating like a few hundred calories a day, but all basically from saturated fat, like mm-hmm. bacon and fatty steaks. And his LDLC is actually sky high. Well, I think probably a genetic result. component there too. I think that's a result from losing weight though too, right? So sometimes when somebody loses Certainly 30, true. 40 pounds, like you'll be like, whoa, mm-hmm. bro, like your blood is, and then they'll maybe tell you that they're, they may have lost weight recently, right? And that to, for lack of a better term, uh, this shit's just kind of floating around in their system. You're right. definitely right. Yeah, that's spot on, actually. You're definitely true. So yeah, that was probably playing a component too. And then there's just genetic variation. So most people don't have their, their mm-hmm. cholesterol levels impacted by di- dietary cholesterol. When we eat it, the actual uh, dietary cholesterol is too big of a molecule to be absorbed in the majority of us. Some people do, though, uh, some people absorb that so they can eat eggs and their cholesterol goes sky high. Mm -hmm. Um, That's not most people. So usually I tell people don't stop eating eggs. They're a great source of protein. If we've tried everything else and cholesterol is still high, then maybe we can pull it out and do a test to see maybe are you this genetic outlier, but most people aren't. So most people don't need to pull out eggs. Uh, just a little side note there. And then, but the saturated fat does seem to increase LDL, but I mean, and seeing you probably eat a lot of red meat mm-hmm. um, and you're doing pretty darn good for not taking any cholesterol lowering agents or anything. So to Mark's argument that it comes to energy balance is probably, you know, pretty accurate. I eat a lot of full yolk eggs too. I never take those yolks out there. Yeah. Uh, that's what there I was going to, I was going to ask. So like I crush a bunch of eggs every single day and my LDL came back at 134. Everything else was within range. That was the only one that actually popped up, you know, with the big scary red, you know, uh, markers on it. Um, so should I try to chill out on some of the eggs or should I just be okay? Because like even the triglycerides, the, uh, the ratio was like four to one or something like that. So everything seems pretty good and I feel good, but I'm just like, 
what does this even mean, like a high LDL? So I'm just been curious about that. Yeah, so I I would say, I mean, you could try to take them out. I would change nothing else and just take out the yolks for maybe a month or so and retest and see if there's a lowering there. And then if so, maybe you are that, that genetic you know, outlier. Mm-hmm. Um, I definitely fall into the camp that lower LDL cholesterol and more importantly, what are considered ApoB containing particles, which LDL are, are definitely atherogenic, meaning that they create plaque. Um, there's people like Paul Saladino who argue that you know it, you can't create plaque without other things too, like inflammation and insulin resistance, high blood pressure, et cetera. And he's definitely right, just in my opinion, like the cholesterol is a common denominator there. And we know that it's always going to be involved. So it's necessary. It's not sufficient, meaning that, you know, it's, it's necessary to cause plaque, but it's not sufficient. You need those other things, but I wouldn't want to take that risk, you know? Um, so I say, try to get that lower too. Um, so for you, Andrew, I maybe would try to do that self-experimentation where you do pull out eggs just for a month or so, and then see if you are. And then if you are, I wouldn't even tell you to stop eating eggs. I would say maybe just implement some medication, something like exetamide, which will block that intestinal absorption. And then you can continue to get all the benefits of choline and everything else that the Mm. eggs have. Mm. One more question. I'm so sorry. Um, no, you mentioned of choline. Uh, we've we got uh, some L carnitine, injectable L carnitine that is mixed with choline. Now, mm-hmm. um, if anybody starts using something like that, the L carnitine choline type thing, will that choline will that have an effect for someone like who's maybe LDL might be an issue for them? Should they be careful with that, or is that something to think about? I, it probably would have maybe a positive effect and it's going to be good for your liver. Um, the concern with like choline and carnitine more is consuming it orally, not mm-hmm. the inject. I think you guys got injectable, right? Yes. Yeah. So the reason why somebody would pick injectable over oral of either of those two is that it they get broken down by the gut microbiome into something called TMAO. Mm-hmm. And TMAO has been at least linked to cardiovascular disease and colorectal cancer. That's where there was a scare a few years back saying that, you know, red meat associated with colorectal cancer or whatever it was. And and there's, a, you know, you can poke holes in that data and it is more correlative. It's not really causative, but because of that, I would say it's probably just better to inject the stuff because one, you're just going to actually get the product. You're not going to be breaking most of it down into TMAO and wasting your money. Yeah. Um, and Hey, if there is a link there, then we already eat enough red meat. Let's not, you know, make it even worse by consuming a lot of these in, you know, their raw form. Um, one thing of note there, there too, if you are consuming those, you can eat more garlic. Um, garlic contains something called allicin, which will stop the conversion of TMAO or of carnitine or choline into TMAO, which is cool. Cool. Okay. The science can go kind of either way on whether cholesterol has a major impact on heart disease at all though, right? Is that about right? Kind of, but kind of not when you look at what are called Mendelian randomization trials, where they basically, they can... So we don't have any causative data, like no randomized control trials where you you ramp people's LDLC up and you give them a heart attack or so. But they can do this Mendelian randomization where you basically let nature do the randomized control trial for you with these calculations that's way over my head. And it'll show you, hey, LDLC and ApoB containing particles are a causative factor. Uh, again, it's not a cause of factor in isolation. Somebody certainly needs to have insulin resistance and you know inflammation and all that other stuff. Uh, I, I just feel like those things are easy to have issues with sometimes, especially inflammation. We, we're all going to get some inflammation. Our arteries are all going to get some wear and tear. Um, also, a pretty interesting thing to think about is when you take like a a teenager or like a 20 year old and you look at their arteries after they're dead, they already have a little bit of plaque in there. And so they probably haven't been exposed to much insulin resistance or much blood, high blood pressure, things like that. And they already have plaque. So we're all going to die with some amount of plaque. I think we should try to limit it to some extent. And I, you know, I don't tell people not to do carnivore or whatever, because I think they can do it very safely. One would be just take medication that can block the cholesterol. But a lot of people who are in the carnivore camp are pretty anti-meds, which I get. So I think you can still eat like a carnivore-esque diet, but not have to load yourself up with saturated fat. You know, you can have Piedmontese beef like you guys do, where the beef is super lean. I don't think I've 
I had chicken today, but most probably seven days a week, I have beef, 96, four ground beef, yeah. essentially the same fat content as a chicken breast, you know? And so you're getting all the benefits of beef and you're getting very minimal saturated fat. You could also eat fish. I know some are kind of weary about the, the plastics or phytochemicals or whatever in fish, but if you're down with fish, you can eat a lot of fish, you know, and would for, and get some health benefits out of it. So you don't have to be like, you know, you don't have to not be carnivore. You can just do things a little bit more cautious and, and cognizant of those and maybe increase your fiber intake a little bit too, which uh, I know you mark eat a lot of uh, fruit and some vegetables, even like Paul Saladino, a lot of fruits. So he's probably getting a lot of uh, fiber and a lot of antioxidants, which can help to offset the inflammation that could cause a heart disease. And so you, know, you can be smart about these things and not have to not be carnivore. All right. Cool. Well, that was, uh, oh, and uh, again, sorry, Andrew, you're going to have to scroll down on this one to the very bottom because for some reason, LabCorp does not include ApoB with the uh, the triglycerides and lipids and all that. But ApoB, like I said, is actually the more important one. I think at Merrick, we've now gotten to a point where we don't even draw the LDLC and the HDLC. We just get the ApoB because, like I said, the ApoB containing particles, which LDL contains ApoB, are the ones to be, you know, worrisome of our be cognizant of. So yours is 78. That's pretty darn good. Um, again, what people would consider normal would be below 90. I would say 60 and below is where we know that cardiovascular disease is probably not occurring. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you're not terrible by any means, especially again, knowing you're not on medication, it can be extremely hard to get to 60 without medication. No, I would almost say impossible. Mm -hmm. And the fact that you do eat such high amounts of saturated fat, like you know, again, to Mark's point, the energy balance is probably really working out for you well because you burn so much. I got a question on that. Um, through Merrick, people can get some genetic testing as well, right? Is mm -hmm. that right? So if people can see if they are, uh, maybe you can clarify it better than what I can say, but it's my understanding you can get tested to see uh, if you're at risk with ApoB and stuff like that, right? It's more the uh, LP little a or lipoprotein oh, there we little go. a, which... Yeah, which we also got in here. And I'm like halfway a doctor. I don't ever trust anything I say, basically, because I could be halfway wrong much. or you could be halfway dead. <laughs> like half, half, of the, half of the time. Yeah. Um, the LP little a or lipoprotein little a, which is on, uh, it's up a page from the ApoB and it's um, right under vitamin D. That's a marker that it's, again, another one of those lipoproteins uh, that wrap around the fat, the cholesterol. And it's very atherogenic, meaning that it causes a lot of plaque. And if you have the gene that codes for that protein, then you're more at risk. Mm. UNCMA do create some, but probably not clinically significant amount of some. So it's usually, I'd like to say below 15 years is at 40. Mm. So you're likely okay. Um, if somebody gets this back and it's like 200, I would urge them to probably not do something like the carnivore diet and just be pretty con like, you know, it's, you're kind of risking it because you already have this marker. Mm. So I'll tell people if they do come back with this, you know, level super high, it sucks. There's nothing we can do about it at this point. There is a drug that's undergoing trials right now that may have some impact on it, which would be cool. But if you were going to pick up smoking and eating McDonald's every day and stuff, you know, just don't because you're already at risk with you when you have this. So um, if you were to have that level high, just try to get your ApoB down as low as you can and try to stay very insulin sensitive and reduce all the inflammatory, you know, things that you can because you do have a risk. But you and SEMA are OK. Cool. OK. And another thing of note there, too, is you only really need to order that one time because you either got the gene or you don't. And so. You know, if people see it high, they don't need to keep wasting their money over and over, and over again because it's going to keep staying high. Mm. Power Project Family, we talk about beef and meat all the time on the podcast. That's why we've partnered with Certified Piedmontese Beef. But did you know this, that 85% of all grass-fed, grass-finished beef in the United States is imported from other countries? 85%. Damn. But Certified Piedmontese is made in the U.S. of A. America. America, fuck yeah. <laughs> so go out and get some of the best tasting, some of the leanest, some of the best beef from Piedmontese. Andrew, how can they get it? Uh, absolutely. Uh, so you guys can head over to cpbeef.com and at checkout, enter promo code POWER to save 25% off your entire order. And if your order is $150 or more, you get free two-day shipping. Again, cpbeef.com, links to them down in the description, as well as the podcast show notes. Fuck yeah. <laughs> 
All right, where are we at now? So lipid panel, then going down to iron. So this is where we can try to see if he gave blood beforehand. And so his iron came back at 61. I guess you could maybe say that that is low-ish. So maybe he mm. did donate blood and <laughs> maybe he donated blood right before he did the last one too because his iron stores are basically the, internet the exact says it. same. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> so... It's possible. I mean, they're not super low. When you see uh, when you see guys who overdonate, usually the iron is lower than sixty. This is not terrible by any means. Actually, I would say very healthy. If I were looking at this, I wouldn't think this dude just donated blood. I think you have really healthy levels of iron for a man. So I'm actually kind of that's cool. my own. Um, yeah, I'm happy to hear that. Kind of when I was a teenager, um, I was anemic, uh, and my mom was too. So I actually started supplementing iron and eating a bunch of spinach as a teenager. I don't supplement iron anymore, but that is something that I've kind of kept in mind over the years because, like, it was there's was, uh, one day when I was like 16, we ended up getting going to the doctor because I fainted in uh, upstairs and uh i fell into the bookcase and a bookcase fell on me and then i went to the doctor he's like you're iron you're you're anemic just like your mother so interesting yeah the yeah. iron was higher so i mean that would i was i was anemic more. so maybe is that iron is low? that mean low iron because i was Correct. technically anemic yeah, yeah. but not yeah anymore. there's a few different types of anemia it can be due to low like uh iron it could be due to a low b vitamin but um, yours, I, I think, was due to iron. Obviously, they gave you iron. Um, yeah. And that could explain why yours is kind of on the lower-ish side. It's not low by any means, but it's, cool. you know, not robustly high either. Um, okay, now this is the big one, you know, testosterone. Here we are. So your previous testosterone was 640 or 639.5, and now you're at 701.4. Mm. Pretty damn decent. Um, great. I know it, that could be TRT, I guess. Um, one thing we can look at just looking here at the testosterone is your free testosterone. We would call your free testosterone suboptimal. We find most guys feel better if their free testosterone is above 18, probably around between 20 and 30. Yours came back at 11. So um, if you were on TRT, I would imagine that your free would be higher. If you were on steroids, your free would certainly be higher yeah. because it will suppress what's called SHBG or sex hormone binding globulin, the protein that binds the testosterone and makes it so it's not readily available or free. So the fact that you have an 11 uh, free testosterone, if you were on TRT, I would say that sucks, dude. Like, you know, you're not you're not a great responder at all. Um, but we can scroll down to the bottom and look at your SHBG real quick, just to see what it is. And yeah, your SHBG is actually kind of high. You know, one could make that argument. Um, usually probably between 20 and 30 would be optimal and yours is at 40. Is there anything that could um, be done to raise your free testosterone that maybe, uh, you know, isn't just a testosterone injection? Like are there peptides or some other route someone could go to just bump that up a pinch? Yeah. So if, and Seema came to us and I saw these labs and he was like, I don't really want to go on TRT yet, but I'm kind of feeling the symptoms, which may be so because his free is lower. The first thing we would probably try to do is lower this SHBG, sex hormone binding globulin, because by lowering that, we theoretically free up more testosterone. And so you can take things like boron, magnesium, uh, even Tonkat Ali, which you know, Huberman's a huge fan of and has talked to you guys about a bunch. All of those will lower that SHBG. Another thing that can help is adding in more carbohydrates. And so, and Sima, you already said you mm. eat relatively lower carbohydrates. No Usually higher SHBG is a marker of good metabolic health in a younger guy because insulin is suppressive on SHBG. So we see crushed SHBG in say like a type two diabetic because they have such high insulin because they're insulin resistant. Um, and so some of the times we get a guy who's doing carnivore or keto and their SHBG is sky high and these, the, the fix could be just adding in some complex carbohydrates to lower that SHBG on top of things like boron and Tonkat and magnesium. Yeah, it was interesting. Um, when I got my lab work done before it was after I did the Fedosia Tonkat thing from Lou Huberman and two mm -hmm. things happened. My LH went up quite a bit. I think my free T went up quite a, like a little bit too, but my LH went up a lot, um, like two or three points or some shit like that. So I'm not yeah, doing we'll be able to see it. Yeah, it's it, it, it might be on there. Um, yep. I don't take like I take Tonkat like every now and then very inconsistently, but maybe I should start taking it more consistently. I take maybe two or three days yeah. a week. 
or even the boron, you know, boron could be good for you too. And, and you could consider adding a little bit more carbohydrates um, mm-hmm. for people listening to, when we say that I'll always tell people, make sure that you pull that out of like your fat calories. Cause you don't just want to blindly add in more carbohydrates. As you guys know, you know, you may gain weight cause you're going to increase your calories. So yeah. reduce it from somewhere else, probably fat to fill in with more carbohydrates. If you're going to go that way. Um, Let's see. So we're on testosterone. And then again, sorry, Andrew, we should scroll to the LHFSH as he just kind of alluded to. Um, These are going to be the biggest thing that somebody can look at to see if one is natural or not. Like you said before, yours was higher LH since for luteinizing hormone. It was 8.9, which is pretty high, which makes sense because you were taking Fidosia, which causes that to be higher. And then now your LH is seven, which I would say is very normal. Your FSH is 6.5, very normal. Uh, It wouldn't be impossible for somebody to have higher levels. You could potentially be taking something like Clomid. And that kind of goes two ways. Like I've seen guys on TRT take Clomid and it makes no difference in their LH and FSH stay low. Uh, Some guys it does stay high. And I've been surprised where I'm like, oh crap, I, I would have not thought you're on TRT, but they tell me my other clinic put me on Clomid to preserve my fertility and not shut me down completely. And I'm still able to keep these levels high. So for all the internet trolls, this, you know, <laughs> and SEMA's LH and FSH being normal, I guess are not, you know, conclusive that he's not on TRT. We would really need like, you know, urinalysis and look for metabolites and everything. But I would say, based on the entire picture here, he looks extremely natural to me. He could be pulling one on off Saul and just taking Clomid, you know, leading up to his blood work, I guess. But it's huge like off Clomid. <laughs> yeah. All the I mean, he could be, you know, on TRT and Clomid, but then he probably would have had to pull back his TRT for a while and try to get it to have a low free, like, you know, just the odds, are, in my opinion, it's in his favor here that, you know, all the labs look super natty to me, but yeah, I don't know. Everybody's in it. People are going to hate, right? Can't, can't win them all. Um, the next one, this one's super interesting. Your hemoglobin A1C. Mm. Um, so when you look at this, it tells you right off about your pre-diabetic. Mm. And I'm sure everybody listens like, what the hell? And Zima's pre-diabetic, you know, and that's kind of what I thought too. It's just, it's crazy. Um, hemoglobin A1C is a great reading. It's a measurement of your blood glucose over the past 90 days. Um, it can basically what happens is as your glucose is elevated, it will bind to the hemoglobin and it kind of changes it. It does what's called glycosylate it. And so when they look at your red blood cells under the microscope, they can tell how much of the hemoglobin has been a, kind of a, exposed to glucose and, and they give you a percentage. So your percentage is 5.7, which puts you in pre-diabetic range. It's not the best test, though, because it can be affected by a lot of different things. So some people have red blood cell lives that live longer than others. So normal red blood cell lifespan is around 120 days. If yours is, I don't know, say 130 or 140 because you're genetically different, yours is going to look falsely elevated. Also, in people of African descent, usually they have some differences in their hemoglobin and it can skew this too. So a lot of African-Americans are erroneously diagnosed with prediabetes or diabetes due to their genetic differences. Um, This is why we would recommend something like a continuous glucose monitor for you. Mm. Um, I actually got in a little bit of an argument the other day on Instagram with one of these evidence-based guys who was like, you know, continuous glucose monitors have no role in people who are not diabetic. And I would argue the opposite because, you know, this A1C isn't the best. And for Enzima, it may be super insightful for you to wear a continuous glucose monitor for a few weeks and take your own averages of your blood glucose over the days. Because maybe, you know, you're coming back at like 80 or 90, which would not be a 5.7 A1C. That'd be like a 5.1 or so. Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, so looking at this, I, I would argue you're probably not. Previously, it was high too. You know, and I don't think that you're a pre-diabetic individual. Um, we also like to get the insulin, fast and insulin, which is down on the second to last page. Um, yours the past two times have been low, which is actually kind of interesting. And so I think may, like, you know, if you were somebody that we were working with, I'd probably look into this a little bit more because this could be evidence of, say, like type one diabetes, because that's possible that you don't produce enough insulin. Um, so you would maybe have to order things like a C peptide or there's various, um, antibodies that you can look at pancreatic antibodies and see if you have that diagnosis of type one diabetes. 
I think you're probably just very healthy. I mean, you don't have any symptoms of, of diabetes, right? Like chronically urinating or feeling thirsty all the time or, you know, yeah, I would guess you're probably not, but. I have a question. Um, being like West African, there's a lot of people like I have something called sickle cell trait. I don't know if you know anything about that. I don't know if that has anything yep. to do with this or if it can. It has everything to do with it. Okay. What? what yeah. How does that affect it then? So it can affect the reading because the sickle cell has to do with the red blood cells and traits on them. And so it kind of changes everything based on, so it's an abnormal red blood cell basically. So when I said uh, people of African descent, you know, that's kind of what I was getting at is they have different hemoglobin than others do. Okay. And so, yeah, that kind of explains everything. So it makes a lot of sense. Um, one thing though, too, that, that, that high A1C is in your favor for Mark accusing you of donating blood. If you had donated blood previous to that, your mm -hmm. A1C would actually probably be pretty low because usually right after donating blood, you produce a lot of red blood cells to replenish the red blood cells that were just donated. And they would probably have a very low reading of, of glucose. Not much of them would be exposed. So if you see a super low glucose or an A1C on somebody, I'll usually ask that you just give blood because it may be kind of falsely low. So yours would have been lower if you donated blood. So another check for the natty. We should have a tally going. Like, <laughs> ding, natty ding, ding. Not. <laughs> natty tally. Uh, would something like uh, like berberine or something like that, Would do you think, I mean, if he has any issues with uh, glucose, do you think that would be helpful in any way? Yeah, I don't think his, he has any issue with glucose, but if he was just some, if this wasn't in semen, it came back and, you know, a guy with 5.7 for sure. Berberine would be great. Um, also metformin. Both of them work to help to sensitize the tissues, specifically the muscle tissues to insulin so that the glucose can be shuttled in. Um, metformin can also stop the liver from overproducing glucose, which happens when your metabol or your glucose metabolism is kind of deranged your liver is just kind of inappropriately cranking out glucose and metformin can stop that from happening. Um, so yeah, if this was not in SEMA and we didn't know his, you know, history and everything, then um, that would be a great tool. Okay. Um, DEA, that's in the, or DHEA, not DEA, screw the DEA. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the DHEA um, is, uh, is basically a neurosteroid. It's also a precursor to testosterone. Um, this one is one that's actually really important that a lot of people don't look at. Um, as a neurosteroid, it plays a, a vital role in our brain health. So it can help to, uh, if guys have lower DHEA, they may be experiencing things like brain fog maybe some anxiety, they can have a role in libido and sleep quality. Um, DHEA is one that I never looked at in myself for years, and I did years of anabolics, which can have a suppressive effect on DHEA and its counterpart, pregnenolone. And I got to a point where I just randomly felt all this low libido and kind of down in my mood, and I didn't know why, and I finally drew these, and mine were basically zero. Ooh. So it's important to look at them. Um, they are also implicated in neurodegeneration. So as we age, they usually go down and there's some papers kind of suggesting that they play a role in our brain health. So having good levels of this, which you do, I would say around, you know, if you're not symptomatic of having low DHEA, like this, you know, anxiety or brain fog or things, there's probably no need to supplement it with where you're at. We usually try to get guys like 300 and above, but I don't want to just start supplementing if there's no reason to, if you're not actually low. Uh, so this looks good. Um, you could be supplementing with it, but for a lot of guys on TRT or, or steroids, their DHA is usually low like mine was. Okay. Yeah. Uh, cortisol, next one. We all know cortisol being a stress hormone. I don't like to put a lot of weight into just the blood reading of cortisol unless it's crazy on either side of the spectrum, just because cortisol is fluctuating all the time. And so you know, if you had a, a stressful time getting to the lab, you know, you got cut off or, or whatever, you were pissed at the guy in front of you, and now you're anxious about getting your blood drawn, sometimes you may see your cortisol is a little bit higher. And most people are getting their cortisol done first thing in the morning or their blood done first thing in the morning, which we expect cortisol to be higher. Mm. So yours is actually, I would say maybe on a little bit of the lower side, but you took it midday. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. So it's cool. You probably have totally fine cortisol. But if people are more interested in getting a more accurate look, they can do something called a Dutch test, which is a urine test where you're urinating throughout the day. And then you get a better reading of your cortisol over a 24 hour period to see if it's appropriately being produced. 
Um, some people who have issues with sleep have cortisol dysregulation where their cortisol spikes in the middle of the night when it shouldn't, and that wakes us up. And so if you're waking up in the middle of the night, like craving carbs, you're hungry, maybe look into you know, looking at your cortisol because it could be an issue with that. All right. Um, again, we're now we're just going past your LHFSH, which look very normal. Um, we're at prolactin again. So um, prolactin, I know we've talked about with you in the past in SEMA because you were historically high in prolactin. Mm -hmm. And I think we chalked it up to the use of kratom because we know that kratom can elevate prolactin. Yeah. And then this is one that you know, a lot of people took away from the last podcast. We I always have guys like, oh, it was so insightful because I had all these symptoms. And I thought I had low T, but they actually had high prolactin mm -hmm. due to things like, you know, maybe kratom or marijuana use is another big one. Um, but high prolactin, again, if you guys didn't listen to the previous one, it can kind of masquerade as low T. Um, you can feel low libido, poor erection quality. You may feel like you're unable to achieve orgasm, which for some guys, maybe that's good. You can go longer, but it can also be annoying. And then, you know, your refractory period can be extremely long too. So it can take you forever before you get interested to do it again. Mm -hmm. um, prolactin, you know, being it's made right after we have an orgasm. And, you know, as all guys know, right after that, you pretty much just feel like you're asexual for a few minutes, you know? Yeah. Why the heck was I even doing that? You know, <laughs> why was I looking at that thing? Um, and that's if your prolactin is high, you can kind of feel like that chronically. Mm -hmm. So as far as my prolactin is concerned, if you can actually see the previous state, it was at 18.8. .8, now it's at 12.4. Mm -hmm. So I still use Kratom, but I don't use as much as I was before. Because before I was like, it was something I'd be using maybe five times, but, but also a fairly high dose of it. I just decreased my frequency in the amount I take. I do smoke weed every now and then, um, but my prolactin did come down quite a bit. So Yeah, it did. Yeah. Are you taking P5P? I know. I think uh, we what's were P5P? suggested you did. Uh -uh, I haven't taken no, that yet. What is P5P? <laughs> yeah, what's P5P? Yeah, so it's the, uh, the active form of vitamin B6, and it can have a suppressive effect on prolactin. So yeah. if you guys have high prolactin, that's usually the go-to. You know, I try to uh, as Mark will remember, a lot of guys will take like caber or something. I would suggest people don't mess around with that. I would try, you know, B6 first or active form of B6, specifically P5P. So I can just go on Amazon and type in, that. go to Amazon, type in P5P and then just get a supplement yeah. like that. All mm -hmm. right, let's do that right now. Yeah, it's supposed to help you with your refractory period as well, right? Exactly. Probably yeah, even more with that prolactin. Yeah. Um, some people, uh, like I've seen Everybody's some influencers. <laughs> And I've seen out. some influencers recently talking about like uh, P5P causing neuropathy. And I'd say they're kind of wrong on that because P5P is the active form of vitamin B6 and the unbioactive form, just plain P, uh, B6 can cause neuropathy. But kind of paradoxically, the this P5P does not, and it may actually help neuropathy. So just, you know, people have heard people saying these things, I would disagree with them. And if you look in the literature, P5P actually probably doesn't cause neuropathy. So you're likely okay. Cool. All right. Do you know what your testosterone levels are at? How about your estrogen? How about your prolactin? How about your cholesterol? If the answer is, I don't know what they're at. Well, we've been talking about blood work for a long time now. That's why we've partnered with Merrick Health, a company owned by Derek for more plates, more dates. Now with Merrick, you can get yourself something called the Power Project Panel, which will give you 26 different labs that will help you understand what's going on underneath the hood. After that, you'll be able to be partnered with one of their patient care coordinators, which will give you interventions that range from lifestyle supplements to potential hormonal health treatments that can help move you in the right direction. But it all starts with knowing on what's going on down here. So get your blood work done. And Andrew, how can they get it? Yes, we have two options for you guys. Head over to MerrickHealth.com slash Power Project. That's M-A-R-E-K Health.com slash Power Project. There you guys will see the Power Project panel that Encima was just talking about. And at checkout, enter promo code Power Project to save $101 off of that panel. Now, if you want to custom select your own panel, you guys can use promo code Power Project 10 to save 10% off all labs. Again, that's at MerrickHealth.com slash Power Project. Links to them down in the description as well as the podcast show notes. Um, next is your PSA, prostate specific antigen. So this one again, may or may not be elevated when you're on TRT or steroids. It, it may elevate a little bit. You definitely look in the natty realm, but I mean, I think my PSA is the same thing. And so my prostate hasn't really been affected by 
the androgen so for the years and so you know that one's hard to tell but your prostate looks healthy right now it's it's you know it's not in a high range that you would have to worry about that so we can't gather much off this it's not high or anything got it um and then yeah i don't even get into prostate but i think you're fine there okay um igf1 your you went down a little bit you were at 200 you're now at 162 um Again, you took this in the middle of the day, so that could be playing a role. Mm -hmm. uh, IGF is probably going to be higher in the morning right after sleep because we produce growth hormone while we sleep, and growth hormone stimulates your liver to produce IGF-1. And so, you know, it's going to be lower midday or at the end of the day than it would be first thing in the morning. Um, IGF-1 is one that I don't really worry about too much. I know a lot of guys love to chase it because they think it's correlated with horm their growth hormone and everything. Um, but you know, Mark and I have had this conversation, like growth hormone, it's not always all it's cracked out to be, you know, like some people love it, yeah. but like all I ever experienced was water retention on it. You know, I never felt like I got any leaner. I never felt like I got any stronger or bigger. I think I got a little bit uglier when I was taking it. Honestly, <laughs> I felt like it was aging me. It's kind of interesting. Um, that's about it. All right. Let's see. Your vitamin D looks good. I mean, you're previously were a little bit better. You were at 70. Now you're at 51. I usually opt for about 50. Uh, most people probably need a mixture of both of, uh, you know, supplementation and sun to get good levels. You're pretty good. Do you supplement? I supplement um, inconsistently, a bit more consistently the past few weeks after I saw this. But also one thing that tends to happen, and it also I mean, it happens with my mood, it happens with my weight, is when it starts to get sunnier, I just, I'm outside so much more. I'm literally sitting outside in the morning. I'm sitting outside midday. I go for more walks. When winter time comes, because it's interesting, when this, when my uh, vitamin D was taken before is during the summer months, I'm always outside. Yep. I'm even fucking darker. But when it gets to the winter months, I, I don't get outside as much. I usually weigh five pounds heavier. I'm not, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, I think that's probably has a lot to do with it too. Yeah, I agree hundred percent for sure. And I would say that the, the lack of sun affects a lot of us and most people just in our normal day-to-day -day lives, we don't get enough sun. Mm -hmm. And so I would definitely recommend supplementing and doing our best to get some sun, which I know you guys preach all the time. And I like yeah. you to just, you know, get some freaking sun exposure of some sort, at least 10 or 20 minutes a day. If that's all you can get, uh, it's going to do, you know, a lot for you for sure. Um, we already talked about the LP little a, now we're at CRP, and this one's an important one when you're considering your heart disease. This is a marker of inflammation. This was interesting. So, yeah, the, the CRP previously on you was high. You were almost at four. Mm -hmm. um, when I see a super high CRP in that, in what seems like an otherwise healthy individual, it's likely more that that inflammation is a, a normal. It's of normal origin. The thing about a CRP is that it's very sensitive, meaning that it will pick up like all bits of inflammation, but it's not very specific. We don't know where it's coming from. And so, you know, you could have had a cut on your body. You could have been fighting off a cold. That's why it could have been elevated. You know, mm -hmm. I'm more concerned with somebody that has a really low grade inflammation, like maybe a one or so, because that's more indicative of maybe that chronic low grade inflammation that we're concerned with that's associated with like heart disease. Um, Recommendation is usually the same either way, which is just increase your antioxidant intake, probably the best way to do so with food. So either increase fruits and vegetables or just fruits and even organ meat, you know, make sure that you're getting some bit of antioxidants in your diet. Then you can supplement with it too. Same things we talked about before, the N-acetylcysteine, the um, glutathione. I like melatonin a lot as an antioxidant, omega-3s, all of those things can help. Glutathione, you've actually mentioned it multiple times and I... Just took some today at the uh, suggestion of Jake Benson for recovery. So can you kind of explain some of the benefits of glutathione? Um, just because like even me, I, he said it's great for recovery, but even I'm not sure <laughs> exactly what it's doing for me. Yeah, glutathione is like, I was actually really impressed with it myself. And I usually feel like nothing lives up to it. its name. When I've tried like everything, I'm always like, you know, bummed. First time I tried trend, I'm like, this is kind of lame. Growth forming, you know, all those things. Like, I never thought that it was as cool as they were advertised, but glutathione was pretty damn impressive. 
Um, I got roped into one of those Spartan races where I had to do like a 10 K and I do almost no cardio and you know, I I do just a little bit here and there, but I was like, fuck it. I'll just go do it. And I did the whole thing and ran the whole thing. We got decent time, did every obstacle. And I thought I was going to have rhabdo for sure. Mm -hmm. So I hit myself with a ton of glutathione right afterwards. The next day I was barely sore, which was like mind blowing to me because the whole time I was cramping. So I was impressed. I was like, okay, this, uh, this just convinced me. Um, but glutathione is basically pr- you know, produced by every cell in our body. It's the most potent antioxidant that we have. So it helps to fight off free radicals, um, reactive oxygen species, things like that, that would cause inflammation or damage um, to our cells. So having robust levels of glutathione are great because it's, you know, it's keeping your body less inflamed. So that's where it can be beneficial. Okay. Um, people will take it for their skin too, because it has a positive effect on skin. I think it has some skin lightening effects. So I don't know. Be careful on SEMA. You might, you know, get white here soon. Um, <laughs> gonna be looking like Michael Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> No, um, I don't think it's that in, 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 in intense, but I've heard it does have some skin lightening effects. Okay. Um, but yeah, I think it's amazing for, for recovery. And if you have high inflammation markers, it's something that we found very beneficial. Any type of dangers or anything to be careful with when trying to use glutathione? Because you say it's so great, right? There's going to be someone who's going to be like, okay, I'm going to take glutathione every day. So is there anything yeah. to be careful with? So I can't back this up because I didn't really dig into the literature, but having a conversation with another intellectual I respect a lot, he was telling me that he thought there was some uh, negative feedback with supplementing with glutathione, meaning that like when you take it, you're just like if you take testosterone, you stop producing testosterone, there may be some negative feedback with glutathione. And so I like to use NAC or N-acetylcysteine as well, because that's a precursor to glutathione. Mm. And so if you're taking it also maybe take the oral and supply your body with what it needs to produce its own. Again, I can't substantiate that. I just kind of took it at face value and was like, okay, sounds, makes sense. Uh, but that would be my biggest concern with it. Okay. All right. I'm just going to make sure not to use it extremely frequently. That's what I'm going to yeah, do. Yeah, or, or do it, you know, concurrently with uh, supplementation of like N-acetyl. uh, N-acetylcysteine. Okay, gotcha. Cool. Um, let's see, GGT, another marker of uh, liver enzymes. And this is a, a good one to get to. And this is why we throw it on the panel for athletes is because if your GGT is not elevated, but your liver enzymes are, then there's some, you, we can kind of safely say your liver enzymes are probably just elevated because you worked out before, mm-hmm. like we talked about with you. So your GGT, it looks good. It's another liver enzyme, probably okay. Um, progesterone, that's an important one. People think of it as only, you know, being a female hormone, but it plays a vital role in men too. And having too low of progesterone can cause, you know, poor libido and poor moods, anxiety and things like that. And it can be kind of a, a cheap man's marker for checking your pregnenolone because pregnenolone downstream will convert into um, progesterone. And so yours is okay. I mean, we could try to get it up a little bit higher. It'd be interesting to see what your pregnenolone is because mm-hmm. you may benefit from having some higher levels of pregnenolone, which downstream would be good for progesterone. Okay. Um, one thing of note here too, is that a lot of guys come to us because Derek's like the hair God, you know, he does everything about hair loss and everything. So a lot of guys are interested in that and they want to know if they can take finasteride. And this is an important thing to look at as your progesterone before starting because the, the five alpha reductase, the enzyme that finasteride blocks, it doesn't only block the conversion of testosterone into DHT. It also blocks things like the conversion of progesterone into allopregnenolone and allopregnenolone is a vital neurosteroid that plays a role on our brain. And so you know, people will talk about having post finasteride syndrome where they have brain fog and low libido, and it may be due to it blocking some of these neurosteroid cascades. So if you're already starting out with a low progesterone, you may not want to start taking finasteride. Uh, I'm good on that, man. Mm-hmm. I'm good yeah. on that. I think my, you're good. Yeah, you, don't yeah, want, yeah. you don't want the afro? <laughs> Fuck no. Nah. You know what? My head's so big that I think I even look better bald. Maybe maybe you I'm look, just coping. Great, man. I might be coping, but I'm okay with it. I don't know. I think you pulled off well. Thank you. You had some pictures before with hair, right? I think I saw it once and I felt like you looked weird, honestly. I was like, <laughs> he looks way better like this. Hey, you know what? I'll take that. I feel kind of hurt, but at the same time, <laughs> no, no, no. I'm you know, because I've only seen you. <laughs> yeah. I've only ever seen you bald, but you like pulled off well. And then when you see you with hair, I'm like, no, he, he's like, bald's perfect. Even if you could grow it, I would suggest that. I mean, you look Thank good. you. Thank you so much. <laughs> 
You're welcome, man. Um, let's see. We talked about insulin. Again, that was an interesting one for you. Probably just very metabolically healthy. Mm -hmm. This is really important to look at. Um, this will tie back into what's normal and what's uh, optimal too. Like if you see on there, the range for normals basically goes all the way up to 25. Yeah. But there's some pretty clear literature that below five is when somebody's truly insulin sensitive. So your body would be producing higher levels of insulin if it was insulin resistant, especially in a fasted state, you shouldn't be producing insulin. So you're just probably extremely insulin sensitive because you're so damn fit. Okay. And that's why yours are low. So we actually look at like one to five as being optimal. So I don't say this is too low. I don't think you have that type one diabetes, like I said, but um, I think you're very, you're very insulin sensitive and this is important to look at. So you know, like Paul Saladino talks about if you have insulin resistance. So if your insulin was fasted and you're at like 15 mm. and you also have a high ApoB and LDLC, it's not a good thing. You know, you need to improve that insulin sensitivity and the berberine like Mark brought up can help, but more importantly, reducing calories and exercising and the more muscle you can build, the better, because you're going to have more of a reservoir for glucose. And so just exercise and eat less, you know? Okay. Um, ferritin. Ferritin is a, a, a protein that carries around iron, but it can also be a marker of inflammation. Um, I think, like, you know, if you saw our lab report, it probably told you you were high, but I don't always kind of agree with that. It, you kind of have to look at the whole picture and your CRP looked okay. I don't think you're probably overly inflamed, but for some people, if their ferritin is really high, it could be a marker of inflammation. So it would be something to consider. And again, same type of things. The glutathione is great at helping your liver to um, uh, metabolize ferritin. So it would help to lower that. Got it. Uh, and then the last three we've already talked about, your T3. Again, we need to boost that. So we're, I would say supplement with some selenium and keep an eye on this. And we'll see if we can get it optimized. You can take like a thyroid support complex. Um, your SHBG, a little bit higher. That's why your free is low. So we're going to supplement with some boron, maybe, or magnesium. You already supplement with magnesium, I think. But And then the ApoB, the cholesterol marker. So yeah, you basically just got taken through the whole Merrick process here. As, you know, we would go through all of that in your lab review. Cool. I think it's cool to see like how, um, for example, P5P, I've never taken boron, so maybe I should try taking that. Uh, it's cool that just normal supplements can have a very big effect. Because I think people downplay the effect that normal supplements can have and like we'll just go straight to hormones, you know? So Yeah, true. Even food, you know, like food too, for yeah. the selenium, I mean, you could just start eating Brazil nuts and maybe that's the option you want to do. Mm -hmm. Some people do that. Um, so you could you know, put in a few Brazil nuts a day and some oysters and things that contain zinc. Probably good on that on meat. But yeah, food and, and supplements can go far. Sick. Yeah. And when you work with Merrick, um, you not only are talking to a doctor, but you're also talking to a, a patient care coordinator that... Uh, is going to be kind of the middleman that you can ask tons and tons of questions to because you're not always going to have uh, access at any second to the actual doctor themselves, but uh, you get more than enough help. And I think a lot of other TRT clinics I've heard from other people just them kind of complaining, like I'm trying to ask these questions. I'm not there, you know, I don't know how to get answers and stuff like that. And I haven't found that to be the case with you guys. You guys are on top of it. Yeah, we've actually kind of even changed their name over to health coach because that's what we want yeah. the, them to be as a health coach that can be there to coach on all the things. Um, so coaching on nutrition and sleep and supplementation, and they'll do the lab review with you like this. So you know, we more just did a, an educational lab review here that wasn't diagnostic in any way. You know, I didn't tell you you had anything. You know, I, didn't, you know, I didn't really interpret your labs, just kind of gave an educational, entertaining kind of review and that's what the health coach can do with you and you know they can say like oh and see you know your insulin's low this is interesting it could be linked to these things we'll see what the doc says but at least you get that first right when you get the labs then you can do this with the doctor and then they'll talk to you even after that and go over all the treatments that the doctor has laid out and they're going to be checking on you making sure that you got your package good and you're using your meds good and you understand everything so yeah there's a lot of like that one-on-one -on -one concierge care which is cool yeah uh, th that's that's one thing you know like Everybody has different lifestyles. Maybe some someone's a nurse, they don't get much sleep, you know, or you have kids, so you're waking up multiple times during the night and you're super active, right? And a normal doctor may not necessarily pay attention to all those individual things, but over with you guys, like you guys pay attention to people who are athletes and have super high creatinine or X, Y, yeah. and Z. And it makes a difference because, I mean, I've been to a doctor when I was much younger. I was told I had high creatinine and he's like, 
are you, you know, maybe you need to decrease that protein intake and stop lifting as much. He legit said that because he's like, uh, things may mm-hmm. not be functioning well, but I'm just an athlete, you know? So exactly. That's, that's yeah. Dope. And I, I think it's, it's a cool place for people to come who want that kind of health optimization. Mm-hmm. Cause like we've preached a million times, we're not a TRT clinic. We're a health and longevity clinic that will do hormones if necessary. Um, there's so many, not so many, but occasionally, you know, we get a stray guy who comes through thinking it's just a TRT mill. And I think those have their place and that's awesome. But if you want 200 milligrams of test and some nandrolone and Anavar and some growth hormone, you know, there's other places to do it. And Mm -hmm. like I said, the outset, you know, there's a lot of clinics where if you've got a pulse, they've got somebody who will write you that. And we're just not bad. And so if you're really, you know, if you want what you and I just did here in semen, where we take a deep dive into your health and we talk about lipids and inflammation and everything, that's where we shine. Um, Cause it's just, you know, we're, we don't really like to work with somebody who just wants to ramp up their testosterone. It can be one part of a complex plan to make you an optimized human, but it's not the end all be all. Nice. Thank you so much for your time today. Appreciate it. Of course, man. Yeah. It's fun. Yeah. Thank Where you. can people find you, and uh, what's the name of this new podcast you got going on? Yeah, so uh, my company is Atlas Optimization. Um, Merrick doesn't actually hire any uh, doctors or providers; they hire com- you know they they will put you with a provider who's their own entity. Essentially, they're kind of the matchmaker. Uh, the PCCs or the health coaches are with Merrick, but the doctors and providers aren't. So my company is Atlas Optimization that I work through, and and it's my wife and my company. She does nutrition coaching, Um, and then our company is Atlas, and we have the Atlas Hour on um, YouTube, which you just search Atlas Optimization, you can find us. Then my Instagram, um, at Dr. Dr. period A.E. Hotchkiss. That's my name. And then you can find me there, and and our our, uh, Instagram is Atlas Optimization, so... And then Merrick, of course, obviously Merrick, uh, you know, they're, they're really the, the reason we're all here. And I, I love Merrick, you know, it's, it's awesome. I'm so happy to be able to do stuff like this. Cause yeah, it's just, you're, we change lives every day. It's awesome. Great. Have a great rest of your day. Take care. Thanks doc. You guys too, man. Right. See you guys. Thank you. All right. Deep dive. Very cool. Yeah. Deep dive into your blood. Hmm. No, it, it, I'm, I I like getting my blood work done. I'm probably going to get it done maybe again another six months or something like that just because it's like right now I'm in the midst of training. Like I'm training a lot. I'm doing a lot of sessions of jiu-jitsu a week, uh, some days, double days, so six to eight sessions a week right now. And I'm still lifting with that because I'm getting ready for competition. So I'm happy to see that everything is where it needs to be because I do feel a little bit run down on certain days. Mm-hmm. But um uh, it, it's it's nothing I need to necessarily be worried about, and also it's also I'm also pumped because I do eat a lot of saturated fat, I do eat a lot of red meat, I do eat a lot of calories, and it's nice to see that that isn't having any negative effects on my health because of my activity level, right? So that's just uh, I'm, I'm I'm happy that that's all dealt with. What you training for? I got worlds in like six weeks. I'm on the waiting list for two competitions this month, um, so hopefully I'll be able to get into those comps. And, uh, yeah. Have you ever trained this frequently before? Yes. Yeah. Most of the time. But this is a little bit newer. Like, uh, the only thing that's new is traveling. Okay. My frequency of training has been there. There was a period of time, especially when we were really ramping in podcasts for maybe six months where I had to only train three, some weeks if I was lucky, five sessions jujitsu. But for years, it's literally been, it's been like more like four to seven to eight now it's six to eight on average Mm. and it's just it's i'm feeling good and i also told you like my one of my body weight is between 240 245 and 250 that's when i feel good when i get above 250 i'm okay but that's when i like i feel a little bit slower Mm. i don't i I don't feel as quick so i'm feeling really solid that's great that's that's quite a time commitment you know it's like if you're doing six sessions and eight sessions and so on i mean it you're like looking at probably about two hours a pop. You have about an hour of travel sometimes when you're going to San Jose. Mm, three hours each way. Cause I three take the hours train. each way. There but since go. I take the train, um, we can get work done on the yeah, train. Yeah, the train. Yeah, it's helpful. Yeah, yeah. But I, I, there's this comment from Brian Boudreau. Uh, he trains over at Super Training Gym and it was uh, from our podcast where we, it's titled TRT, What It Feels Like Benefits and Drawbacks. And Brian's on TRT, but he mentioned this. My only regret is not getting labs done before I built the habits 
then started TRT. Brief recap of my journey. Five years ago, I was obese, 300 pounds with bad anxiety and no direction. Got my nutrition figured out and got down to 185 pounds with diet and exercise, which took about 18 months. Found Mark and crew, got serious about training consistently and adopting good habits. Built myself up to about 205 pounds. Got labs done and decided to get TRT at 37 years old. Weight went up to about 225, 230. This man got huge, by the way. Like he, He's competing though, so he's... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's for a purpose. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm just saying, like, physically, he's just like, you know, like, he, <laughs> oh, yeah. not, he wasn't, when he I say jacked. huge, I don't mean fat. I mean, Brian got hub. Yes. That's what I'm saying. Um, but waist, uh, 225 to 230, but waist is still almost the same as it was at 185. All my pants still fit around the waist, but are tighter in the thighs from legs <laughs> getting jacked. My labs are better now than ever. Lifts have all gone up. Sleep has improved. Motivation is higher. Attitude is more positive and optimistic. Please listen to these guys when they say build the habits first. Test will amplify what you already are. So be who you want to be prior to getting involved with hormone optimization and then watch yourself grow physically and mentally in the right direction. Thanks, MBPP, for always spitting hot fire and dropping knowledge bobs for the masses. Love you guys. Love you too, Brian. Damn, really well said. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's awesome. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Uh, is there any other precautions you're trying to take with, like, that much training? Like, um, I know you mentioned we, we talked about you have implemented some carnitine. Is there any extra attention to, like, sleep or sleep habits? I know you have good habits, but are you just, like— uh, I don't know. Is there anything you're wait, that you're just like maybe more diligent about or you've been on point in the past, you think? The big thing, and it's things that we've learned from a lot of the guests that have come on, like Kador, um, Kador especially, and there are a few other, like Ben Patrick and a few people that have come to mind on, on the whole movement spectrum, even Human Garage. And the big thing that I do now is I make sure every single day to get in positions that – typically you don't always get in. So, you know, Kador has his practices of sitting on his knees and mm -hmm. sitting on the floor. I'm always sitting on the floor now. I'm always putting myself in, in different positions because first off, jujitsu requires that. And I don't want the only time I end up in those types of positions mm -hmm. to be when I go to the mat. And then the rest of the day, I'm either standing or sitting in a chair or whatever. My body, everything feels so loose because I make sure that I always venture into those positions. I've actually been doing some of the fascial maneuvers from Human Garage. I, I sent you one of the simple ones and all their stuff is free. Um, but I noticed like there was one day when my lower back was feeling a little tight when I woke up. Mm -hmm. I did this totally twisted maneuver from their page and there's multifactorial. Maybe my body warmed up a little bit, but after I did that for like 15 minutes, I felt good, mm -hmm. right? These, these are the little additions, but the main thing is getting into positions that I typically don't get to outside of jujitsu. Even now, like, Andrew, if you go to my story real quick on IG, um, I'm working on this back bridge thing because like, you know, in jujitsu, <laughs> you're always here. So how about full extension? Uh, wrestlers are able, like there are some wrestlers that are oh, yeah. able to walk <laughs> and even run in that position. So I'm trying to get myself more used to that position and I have been, and that's been helping. So these are just things that like, I think these are just habits, whether you're at work, whether you're sitting at home, um, even little things like when I eat, I'm usually standing and my foot's up on something when I'm eating and then I always take a walk after. I just, I try to keep everything lubricated and that's why my body's been feeling really good. But go to my story, dog. Mm, okay. Like that was a few days ago. Next Seems door. likes to be lubed up. Yeah. So. Nice. Next okay, one. I got you. I know. Yeah. Setting it up. Yeah. So now I'm able to finally do push-ups in this position. And there's Sweet. more extension in it too, so the everything's feeling really good. Awesome. Oh, fumble. Yeah, lots of lots of habits, uh, you know, all all smashed together. Is there anything like uh, that you're trying to not do, like not eat certain foods or anything? Or are you just again, you have good habits, so maybe you're not overthinking it. I'm just trying to make sure not to eat too close to bed because I have noticed that that does affect my sleep quality. Um, it's it's not necessarily even I could eat something really healthy like a, a good steak or whatever, mm -hmm. but I'll notice like my heart rate's a little bit elevated, um, and I don't wake up feeling as rested. But the thing is, I get hungry at nine p.m. Mm -hmm. So I'm just trying to be more diligent at like having my last meal at maybe six or seven, mm -hmm. and then if I do eat something, maybe it's a little bit of fruit or whatever that's not that's not as heavy. Smaller, yeah. Because that affects sleep, and we've gone deep on how. If you don't recover in your sleep, right. well, you can go work as hard as you want. You're not getting everything out of it. Uh, even the stuff that you train, 
you're not going to be able to remember it as well if your recovery isn't as good, right? Mm. So I'm, I'm making sure I do that stuff, making sure I get to bed at the same time, you know, because I have noticed when I sleep a little bit later, even if I get the same amount of sleep, I don't wake up the same, mm. right? So yeah, just trying to keep everything dialed in, trying to keep the body moving, trying to also like walk after every meal. That's something I've been trying to be more mm. diligent about too. And it's, it's an underrated thing. Because I yeah. notice my digestion and the Huge. way I feel. Yeah, yeah, if I can just take a 10 or 20 minute walk after I eat, I feel so much better than if I just eat and then just sit and chill. You know, that's that's a huge one that goes a long way. And you talked about that a lot, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, you know, I'm not even necessarily suggesting that someone do this, but, you know, I, it's been explained to me before, and I, I don't practice this enough, but it's been explained to me before, you should be able to, like, go on a light jog as soon as you're done eating. <laughs> so, I mean, it's a nice practice. I, I don't think uh, any of us are going to get it until we're, like, 55 or something. <laughs> you know, we're going to be older, and we're going to be like, I'm doing this new thing, but... It's kind of hard sometimes, you know, you're in the moment and you think you need to eat all this fuel. Being an athlete too, you're like, well, I better just, you know, I better just hammer all this food. Uh, we practice some fasting, some intermittent fasting. And so when the food is there, you're like, man, I should just hammer all this food. I ate four, uh, <laughs> I ate four Piedmontese fillets the other day. They were just too good. I just couldn't stop. I was like in a total frenzy. My wife was just looking at me like, what is wrong with it? I was like, I don't know. I just, just like, these are perfect. They're so good. Was it the petite tender or which, which was filet? Yeah, it was, uh, yeah, I think they're, yeah, they're not, they're not huge, you know, okay. they're, they're little round, uh, mm-hmm. suckers, but I mean, I don't know. It was probably like three and a half pounds of meat or something like that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> God dang, man. I just went all in on mm-hmm. it. Let's, yeah, dog, let's not underestimate the power of like just eating food at home. You know, I think we, even if you try to get healthy Such a food, great healthy habit. Yeah. yeah. Even when you get food inside, it, it, you don't know how that meat was cooked. And I'll, I know, I, I notice the difference of how I feel when I'm just cooking all my meat and cooking everything at home mm. versus when I might, you know, get food out. You, you just Reminds feel the difference. Movie road trip. <laughs> what about it? With the French oh. toast. <laughs> Horatio Sands. He's yep. like, throw, he, the guy uh, takes the French toast because the, the guy sends it back. Uh-huh. And he's like, oh my God, I'm so sorry we got that wrong. I'll take care of that for you. And he takes it back to the kitchen and he throws the French toast up in the air and then he catches it like in the back of his pants. <laughs> and he's like wiggling around doing a little, like a little shake and then he throws it in the pan and he brings it back to the guy. Was yeah, it- he, even, he even walks out and he uh, he like serves him extra coffee and he's like, yeah, the chef, you know, they're, they're working on it right now. But it's like still in the back of his crack as he's like giving the guy coffee. <laughs> Who was in this movie? Was it the guy from Ozark or Adam Sandler? Or am I wrong on both? R- wrong on both. Okay, then I, yeah. I may have not seen Road Trip then. It's a great movie. Yeah, I don't, I don't know any of the... Uh, Stifler was in it, I think, right? But he wasn't as Stifler. Mm. Uh, Tom... Green was in it, mm. and then some other dudes that didn't really do anything else after that. Yeah. Oh, Roach. Okay, no, I, this, damn, I have not seen it. It's a great movie. Austin, Massachusetts. Mm. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Dude, uh, what was the other shot that you took today? It, glutathione. Did that hurt? Go no, in? glutathione okay. didn't hurt at all. Okay, because that choline stuff's burning. <laughs> yeah. Glutathione tripped me out because apparently you got to like reconstitute it. And I didn't know what the fuck that was. So yeah, I was talking with Jake Benson. That? You got to tell me maybe after the podcast. I'll tell you. It's simple. But okay. um, I don't necessarily feel anything. But he said like, you know, it's going to help you on those recovery days. And today is going to be a, a chiller day than yesterday. So, yeah. yeah. The other thing you met, mentioned that you have to be diligent about is your body weight, right? Like you've kind of noticed that in training – when you are rolling that like there's an optimal body weight for you, right? Yeah. It's, it's, it's so interesting. It's like, um, it's between 245 and 250. And like we, I was telling Adam sometimes during the winter months, I don't move as much. Maybe I don't want like I'm not outside as much. Um, so I can get, I mean, there's tie guys with 258 once, but once I'm above, once I get to like 255, 254. Eating your calzone, crying in your Yo. hotel room. <laughs> Simply lemonade. Yo. <laughs> That's my favorite story. I can't, dude, my ankles. <laughs> I, we already told this story, but my last jujitsu tournament, I got second and I went back to my hotel room. And I got myself a whole big old stuffed pizza <laughs> with a whole with a 52 ounce simply uh, lemonade watermelon 
and I woke up the next morning at like 2.59 <laughs> from 2.49. Good thing you get your blood work done then. <laughs> right? Like, you're going to die. <laughs> I was walking to the airport, and my it hurt to put my ankles oh. in my shoes, dog. It's like... <laughs> They're like squishy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, outside of that, when I am like... If I slowly crept up in weight, I'd feel okay. But like when I eat a bit too much, let's say... Um, and I end up being 252, 253, I can literally feel inflamed. I can feel the inflammation. I can feel the stiffness. Mm. I don't move as loose, right? Um, so for me, my best body weight is between again, 245 and 250. And I, I know like if I weigh in at 252, I'm just going to keep in mind, okay, sometimes it's a, just a hydrated 252. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's a, wow, you ate 4,000 calories, 252. <laughs> it's a very different 252. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> so... Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm very careful with that. It's awesome, man. And then, uh, what are, what are things that you're tracking with your, you got your watch and you got your aura ring. And then mm -hmm. we also have the uh, eight sleep. Like, are you paying attention to some of that? And have you yeah. noticed any real differences with some of that technology? Yeah. Yeah. Dude. Like, um, the big thing about the eight sleep and the aura is like the heart rate, the sleeping heart rate. Mm -hmm. Um, again, the nights that I ate too close to bed, I could have a sleeping heart rate at 60, mm. and, were, and that's high for me. Um, a good sleeping heart rate for me is 52 to 54, maybe 55, right? But when it's higher, I also wake up. Like, I can wake up be like, oof, uh, I know when I look at it, it's going to be and your sleeping heart rate 60, and your HRV is like 18. I'm like, yeah, okay. Don't eat right before you fucking go mm. to sleep, right? So these mm, things kind like- Kind of motivation. Mm -hmm. And, and, in a way. Exactly. And it kind of backs up the things you already know. That's what that's why it's it's really dope. You know, I don't want to do this, but it's in my best interest. I'll just do it. Yes. Yeah. And then I mean, that's why the the eight sleep itself is so cool because like, you know, you just you sleep cool. You know what I mean? It, it, it's super helpful. It's getting warm again. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which is nice. But the HRV also has like it, it, it's it my HRV is different too when I eat a little bit farther away from bed because my sleep ends up being better. So all these things, like, uh, all these things add up. It's awesome. Mm -hmm. Andrew, take us on out of here, buddy. All righty. Thank you, everybody, for checking out this episode. Drop those comments down below. Is Encima just a really good athlete, or is he really good at hiding these uh, lab results? And, mm -hmm. you know, he's getting creative with it. Let us know in the comments down below. I know what below. Smokey thinks. I do as well. <laughs> Maybe Smokey can comment in this comment section. Uh, follow the podcast at MB Power Project all over the place. And uh, make sure you guys hit that subscribe button. If you guys are not subscribed, my Instagram is at I am Andrew Z and Seema. Where are you at? Discord's down below, guys. Join on in. We'll probably be doing another Q&A soon, so you can ask your questions there. And Seema in there on Instagram and YouTube. And Seema Yin Yang on TikTok and Twitter, Mark. Andrew, maybe you can tell them uh, where they can get their blood work done and how they can get the uh, Power Project blood oh, work yeah, done. Yeah, yeah, So that's over at MerrickHealth.com slash Power Project. So that's M A R E K health.com slash power project links will be down in the description as well as the podcast show notes but when you go there you guys are going to see the lab i believe it has 26 different labs mm. and then it does include a I, they're going to call it a health coach uh that's going to help you know kind of do what uh dr adam hotchkiss did today you know they're going to break down everything because sometimes when you get these labs it's like i don't even understand what these numbers mean it's like they're speaking in code sometimes so you have somebody that that's going to break them down for you as well as give recommendations and those recommendations aren't just going to be like yep here's a needle go get the testosterone you're going to be good to go no it might be some of the stuff that we heard today like that p5p i've never heard of that was really interesting. That's now in my cart on Amazon. So stuff like that. It's not just necessarily going there and, uh, you know, like I said, hopping on stuff. And this, I believe this is like, this is the best way, like, especially if you have a significant other that thinks like, oh, you just want to get on steroids. It's like, no, I went with a legit doctor, you know, not just somebody on the street corner. Like this is a legit thing. Mm -hmm. So sometimes that's one of the barriers for dudes, you know, and so this is like seriously like the absolute best way. Again, MerrickHealth.com slash Power Project at checkout, enter promo, promo code Power Project, and you receive $101 off of that entire panel, which includes everything we just talked about today. Yeah, I realize there's a cost associated with it, but I think it's worth it. Even if you only go there one time and you get it done one time, especially if you're natural now, I think it'd be great to have those markers. Mm -hmm. um, if you're 30 years old and you and you feel totally healthy, I still think there's a reason to go and get the blood work done. Now when you, you know, maybe someday when you turn 45 or 50, you can say, wow, look at my, my uh, testosterone is very low. I actually do need this medically. It is going to help me a lot. 
as opposed to somebody that just takes it kind of more randomly later, you know, whenever they decide to take them. They don't have any idea what their previous base was. So highly recommended. Strength is never weakness. Weakness is never strength. Catch you guys later. Bye.